Do have a seat and we'll pray. Heavenly Father, you've given us this time and you've given us your word. So we pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would take that which John wrote so long ago, inspired by that same spirit, write it afresh in our hearts and minds, that we may not simply give intellectual approval to what is said, but rather be open to the transforming work of your spirit in our lives, that the truth may be lived out as a witness to the world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Because of the pandemic, I've been listening to more sermons online than is my normal habit. And it's been very interesting because there are some that keep you on the edge of the seat, but then there's not that much content. It's a bit like going out to dinner and needing an Indian restaurant on the way home. But then there are others which are incredibly worthy and absolutely 10 out of 10 for every theological nuance. But you think, goodness, that wasn't half dull. Now, of course, I'm setting myself up to fail, aren't I? Because if you fall asleep after the first five minutes, you can say, physician, heal thyself, and that's fine. But I'm wanting to say, because one of the great things in this evening's sermon is actually about truth. If we have the first slide, that would be great. The second letter of John has these two great themes, truth that transforms and love that obeys. Uh, and you really can't miss them because they come at least three times in the first three verses. So uh, it's not one of those things where you think, where on earth did he get those headings from? Uh, he got both of those headings straight out of the text. It's about truth and love. More beside, but those two certainly. But the truth is to be truth that transforms. Uh, now, I, I know this is one of the most well-taught churches, and I always count it a great privilege when I get a, an email that uh, says, will you come and preach? Uh, normally, before the pandemic, Daphne and I would be about there in the evening service, uh, and it's good to be back now. But being a well-taught church doesn't mean that we think justification, being right with God, is by theological examination. Knowing all the doctrine in the world still needs to be received by faith into our Lord Jesus Christ. What John in his gospel calls believing into him. But then also we're then challenged to live that out in a way that will witness to the world. So that loving each other wasn't just a command of Jesus, though it was. It was, in the New Testament, the witness of the enemies of the church. See how these Christians love one another. It wasn't simply a doctrine of which they approved on Sundays. It was something they lived out Monday to Saturday. In the very earliest chapters of the Acts, we're told that nobody had any need because out of their love for each other, they provided for one another's needs. So these two ideas of truth and love are there in the New Testament throughout the life of the church. Now, the second letter of John. I suppose we should, just to be fair, say, well, which John? Because in the early centuries of the church, some people thought, well, were there two Johns? Was there John, the fisherman disciple? And then there, was there another one called John the Elder? But actually, although you can find references to the use of the word elder, as well as simply meaning what we would call clergyman or church warden or something, to mean a particular person in the second generation after the apostles, it's also because he was the last one of the band of Jesus' followers to die. It was used particularly of this fisherman disciple. So to cut a very long story and quite a bit of reading short, uh, let me quote to you the now in glory former professor uh, of Ryland's Business Exegesis in Manchester, uh, Frederick Bruce, a wonderful brethren scholar, and he said, 
there is no doubt that the gospel revelation and the three letters were written by the same hand, and there is no doubt in my mind that that hand was that of the Apostle John, the beloved disciple who lay on the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper. We do get the self-identification of John in chapter 1 of Revelation and in the last chapter of the Gospel that bears his name. So if you like, the epistles are a kind of meat in the sandwich that comes from the same pen or at the same dictation, which explains why there's a picture of Galilee in the top of my screen. Uh, I couldn't find any public domain, um, make sure you're not sued, photos of an icon of St. John, so I'm afraid you got the Galilee. Let's have the next slide. The author writes for us the gospel, three letters, and revelation. He may not have been martyred, but that doesn't mean he didn't suffer. We know that our Lord entrusted his mother to John's keeping at the cross. If the tradition's right, then he spent the latter years of his life in Ephesus, hence the picture, and we know that he spent some time in exile on the island of Patmos. And if you've been to Patmos, it's lovely for a day trip. Uh, you can walk up and see the monastery and, it, 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 and the cave, and it's fabulous. But don't ever imagine that's how it was when he was there. It wasn't just that he could get on a boat and pop back to Samos or across the water to Kusadasi and get back to Ephesus. No, no, he was there in exile because the authorities did not want him teaching the good news of Jesus Christ to the early Christians in what we would think of as Western Turkey and seeing that faith spread around that part of the Mediterranean. It's not something they wanted and so he was in exile. So where is this one written from? Well, it seems that he's back in Ephesus because he has free access to a church. Did you get that? It says at the end of our letter, the children of your chosen sister send their greetings. It's very unlikely that's just one individual woman. Uh, it appears to be that both in verse 1 and in verse 12 and verse 13, it's simply a, a, a pictorial way of saying the church and the children, not nieces and cousins, but the individual church members. So here is John writing from the secure environment of one church to another church. It also seems likely that that wasn't terribly far away. Uh, you can take your pick from the other towns that the commentaries suggest, but one of those perhaps to whom he wrote the letters in the beginning of Revelation, another town that he knew well. Some of the folks from that place have found their way to Ephesus, verse 4. He's had conversation with them, and he loves the good reports that they bring. It's great to see that there is a real assurance, next slide please, of how the Christians are getting on. And so in verses 1 to 3, what John is trying to say is the fact that you're doing well and the fact that your people who've come to Ephesus are faithfully living out the gospel is not simply well done to you, but it's the faithfulness and grace of God the Holy Trinity. And you really can't miss the Holy Trinity, can you, in the first three verses. Um, do you mind if I do what all preachers do? And having told you you can't miss it, just point it out to you in case you did. Is that all right? Um, to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in the truth, not I only, but all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us. You remember that the Lord Jesus said that he was the way and the truth and the life. And then he breathes on his disciples and says, receive the Holy Spirit. 
And one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit would be to bring to their remembrance, this is all in John's Gospel, all that he had said to them. The truth. So what is the truth that lives in the believer? Well, it's not so much a what as a who. It's not a deposit of doctrine. It's the third person of God, the Holy Trinity, who makes and brings to remembrance all that we need to know of the unchanging truth of the gospel. So there's the Holy Spirit. And then verse 3, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. Ah, that is assurance we need to hear, isn't it? I mean, if I ever thought that my Christian life depended on me hanging on to God by my fingertips, I would give up. But it doesn't, does it? Okay, it's all about being secure, verse 1. That's why he calls it chosen. These are people who are safe forever in the hand of God. And therefore they receive grace. That's the love that starts in the heart of God and flows through us, to us and beyond us in an undeserved channel of God's eternal goodness. We receive mercy. I, I love the verses in the song that talked about our, our standing with joy in heaven before the throne. And you know, as you sang that, and it's not a song I knew, I did think, goodness, what on earth right have I got to stand with joy before the throne? Or as another hymn puts it, faultless to stand before his throne. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. See, it's nothing to do with me, is it? It's, it's, it's not about my deserts or my deeds. It's all about what he does. Uh, one lovely Australian preacher, um, used to be Dean of Sydney, said that when, I, I can't do an Australian accent, but in that lovely straight from the shoulder way, said to a group of uh, British clergy, so what do you want then when you meet God? Justice or mercy? So as far as I'm concerned, give me mercy every time. And it's right, isn't it? That whenever I get on my knees to pray, Lord, I'm going to St. John's. They're a well-taught bunch. I really don't want to screw the sermon up. Will you, will you give me the message for them? I'm not able to say, and Lord, I've been very good this week. My score of sins is lower than last week's. So I really deserve to have a good sermon for St. John's. And it just doesn't work like that, does it? This is about grace and mercy, and because we are recipients of grace and mercy, then we can be recipients of peace. It translates the Hebrew concept of shalom, which means more than a cessation or absence of hostilities. It means a total unity, oneness, and wellness. As, sorry, music group, I just remembered things by hymn tunes and hymn words, but that lovely hymn that, oh, it's a previous generation, that had, it is well with my soul. Well, that's what shalom is. It is well with my soul. I may not have all the answers. There may be still doctor's appointments ahead of me I wish weren't coming. There may be issues in my family, issues in my career. There may be problems even in the church, clearly not in St. John's. But it is well with my soul because grace, mercy, and peace have come from the totality of the Trinity. The Father, the Lord Jesus, and the Spirit who is within me. Now, if I were in a more Pentecostal uh, building than this, I might want to say, why doesn't someone yell, hallelujah? I won't. But actually... It's right, isn't it? You see, we can't simply say, read grace, mercy, and peace and think, oh, good, yeah, we've heard that before. Paul says that. And yeah, we know what that is. Actually, brothers and sisters, if we go through a, a day or a week taking grace, mercy, and peace for granted, then we need to get our Bibles out and get back on our knees and say, Lord Jesus, thank you. 
Thank you for Calvary. Thank you for your love. Holy Spirit, forgive me that, oh, so often I just forget that you've taken up residence in my life. One of the most powerful things I heard in the sermons I've listened to, actually, was one a few weeks ago from Ben, and it was an illustration. I don't know if you heard it. I'm going to repeat it. I've, I've, I have actually used it in one of my sermons by giving him full credit for it, because I thought it was superb. He told the story of a car that he had, and he said that he wasn't the best at keeping his car clean, and that sometimes the mess in the car just got to breaking point, and it had to Something had to happen. And that uh, it was a bit like clearing out the car and then finding there was one stain left on the carpet you couldn't get rid of. And a mate taps you on the shoulder and says, I've got a machine that'll sort that. And he said to us, that's what it means to have the Holy Spirit, that when actually there are things in our lives we can't sort, if I can put it like this, we have a mate who can. Yeah? Yeah? And that's what this is talking about, grace, mercy, and peace. So that's the reassurance, that's the encouragement with which he starts. And the reason for the uh, tiny pair of children's feet in an adult hand is simply that that's what this great elder pastor, St. John, calls those to whom he writes. And sometimes it does us good, even if, like me, you feel that the years of your life are getting into extra time, it's good to know that we're still children, eternally secure in the love of our Heavenly Father. So that's the assurance of verses 1 to 3. Now, I'm not forgetting verses 4 to 6. I'm coming back to that. But I want to flip to 7 to 11, because here's the challenge. Here's the challenge of what it means to be a Christian in a world where the Christians don't set the rules. And isn't it amazing that here we are now in a post-Christendom world and we find that the New Testament was 2,000 years ahead of the times. Because the problem that he addresses here is exactly the problem faced by Christians in most parts of the world. Because in the western part of Asia, province of Asia, a Roman province, it was incredibly Greek thinking. And here's the deal. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out in the world. And we might think, well, what do they think he came in? But let me explain. The way they thought was that God, if there was one, was so far above us and he was entirely a spirit being that he could have nothing to do with matter. You know, this flesh and blood stuff. In fact, they thought that all that had been created, because it wasn't perfect, couldn't have been created by the true spirit God but by some kind of lower ranking deity. So when they heard the Christian gospel, and the gospel had the incarnation in it, here is Jesus, perfectly God and perfectly man, they said, whoa, that doesn't fit with our worldview at all. You're asking us to turn our way the world works upside down. Couldn't you change it a bit? And a century or so after this was written, that the change that some of them did was to say, okay, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the earthly bit. Christ is the heavenly bit. So Jesus was crucified, but Christ had gone back to heaven first. Now, to us, it seems bizarre and nonsense, and it is, and it was. But you see, the pressure was, can't you Christians change your message so that it doesn't challenge our worldview? Now, does that sound a 21st century challenge? Because it does to me. Isn't that exactly what the world around us is saying? Oh, they're not throwing Greek philosophy at us. 
but they are saying, can't you change your idea that Jesus is the only way? Wouldn't it be better if you went for a kind of syncretism where all religions are tracks up the mountain and they all get to the top eventually? Look, can, 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 can you not change what you think about being men and women and gender and identity and what marriage is? Can't, can't you change that? I mean, that, that would just make life so much easier, wouldn't it? You see, the pressure is we're being asked to conform to our culture. Next slide, we'll give that little picture. We're being asked to change our way of thinking and our way of living. We're being asked to take from the center what God approves and replace it with what our society approves. But of course, what our society approves today will be different in 10 years' time, because it always has been. What society thinks of as good and evil goes up and down like the proverbial malarial temperature chart. It is the word of God that is unchanging. That's why if you have your anchor in the shifting sands of contemporary culture, you are heading for a shipwreck. But if you have your anchor firmly in the rock that is Jesus Christ and in his word in Holy Scripture, then it'll be difficult, but you won't be heading for disaster. Now, let me say that in different parts of the world, I, I now, as you, as you may remember, um, try and look after the Archbishop's Thy Kingdom Come evangelistic prayer initiative in the Anglican Communion. That's been fun when you can't live, leave Somerset. Um, but anyway, we press on. And it was got in 172 countries this year, which was fantastic. So, so on we go. Um, but if we were in Africa, I wouldn't be saying to you, and our culture wants us to rethink sexuality and gender, because by and large it doesn't. I might be saying... Our culture doesn't want you to say Christian leaders should be servants, but Christian leaders should be tribal chiefs with the biggest car and unquestioned authority and in some places the ability to siphon off a small slush fund for whatever they want to do. Because that's the culture in some places. You see, Whatever it is, the culture will always be saying to us, can't you be like us? Can't you Christians shut up about the, exclusiv the exclusivity of Jesus, servant leadership, gender identity, the uniqueness of Christian marriage, or whatever else it might be, or oh, because, you know, your life would be so much easier. Sometimes they'll even say, and of course, your churches would be so much more full. Brothers and sisters, that doesn't work. Wherever you sell out on the gospel, people leave. They don't join. Because why would you want to join a fellowship that's prepared to sell out what it believes on the grounds of really nothing? So that's the, that's the challenge that he is looking at here. He says, look out, and he uses such strong language. People who want you to water down the gospel, people who want to say they've got a new addition to the gospel are the deceivers. Oh, and look at this from the writer of Revelation. The Antichrist. If you've read Revelation, it doesn't get much stronger than that as a depiction of the powers of evil. If you sell out on the gospel, you're not playing in God's team strip, you're playing in the devil's. That's what he's saying to them. Now, please, don't get me wrong here. As one commentator said, this is not saying, so don't invite the Jehovah's Witness into your house to explain to them the gospel. It's not saying that. But it is saying, look down here, and it, it can be tough stuff. 
Anyone who runs ahead and doesn't continue in the teaching of Christ doesn't have God and don't have anything to do with them. So it might be something about those with whom we share platforms. It certainly was. I remember um, Dick Lucas saying years ago that there was one Christian dignitary in London and he said, I, I've told him straight <laughs> that with what he believes, he can't come to St. Helens. It's straightforward. Because it would weaken our gospel message if we did. Doesn't mean that you're nasty to them or anything like that, but actually, no, what you're asking us to do is not authentic Christian faith. And what was the touchstone? Well, the touchstone wasn't some minor issue. Should you have bishops? Should you be Presbyterians? Should you baptize adults or children as well? Nothing like that. The touchstone was the person and work of Jesus Christ. They don't acknowledge that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And of course, there were others who would say, well, actually, we don't think Jesus was man at all. He was just God. The incarnation wasn't right. That's why St. John, at the end of Revelation, says, don't add to or take from this book. And it's not without reason that that's the last bit of the last of the 66 books, 40 authors, three languages, depending on how you date the Exodus, 13 or 1500 years in its compilation. And it's not without reason that what we read is don't add to it and don't take away from it. Because there will always be the cultural pressure to do one of those things. I'm stopping. Here we go. What they want us to say next slide is, why can't you be like us? And although in different parts of the world that will have different manifestations, it's always the same challenge because that's how the devil deflects the church from the gospel. So what's the antidote? Don't, don't. Very quickly, four to six. Stick to the script next slide, and walk in truth and love. Stick to the script. I am not writing you a new command. Well, if you've read John's Gospel, you know that. Because it's Jesus who says, love one another. If you've read one John, you know that. Because there he says, how can you say you love God, whom you've not seen, if you don't love your brother, whom you have seen? So stick to the script. There isn't going to be another gospel. There isn't going to be a new syncretistic all religions lead to God agenda. It is I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father but by me and that's it from now to eternity. That's the grace, mercy and peace. It only comes from God the Holy Trinity. So why should the world believe well, because we walk in truth and love. And that word walk, um, St. Paul loves to use a, a word, uh, peripatio it, it, it is, uh, that means to, to, to walk about. And it means the very milieu, the very grass in which you walk is truth and love. That's where you're set. That's where your life is lived in the truth of Christ and in being channels of his love. The thing is, you see, it's a command, isn't it? If you love me, says Jesus, keep my commandments, John chapter 14. And this is my command, that you love one another. He's just underlining it. If you love me, love each other. And John, in his 
old age, writing the epistles, remembers and writes down what his best friend said. Now, the thing is this. I know it's not true in St. John's. But sometimes the people with whom we are called to walk about seem to go out of their way to make themselves less than easily lovable. But you see, the love with which we walk, in which we walk, isn't their love or their loveliness, it's God's. I am not the source of this love. I cannot be the source of this love. God is the source of this love. Where this love is concerned, I am not called to be a well or a fountainhead. I'm called to be a drain pipe. What does a drain pipe do? It channels that which it does not produce to where it's needed. And my brothers and sisters, that's what it means to walk about in love. To channel the love of the Trinity and share it with the world for which Christ died. Now I can say this, final slide, because the guys are away. What is their job? To teach the truth and share the life. What is our job? To hear the truth and share the life. You can't find this in 2 John, but I can find it for you in 1 and 2 Timothy. And to do nothing that makes their ministry more difficult. Amen.